and welcome to this BLC Robert Insight into cross border offering of financial products. I am Shane Mongo, Senior Associate within the Banking and Finance Group here at Bits. I'm delighted today to be joined in this discussion by Pinky Mata, who is an Associate within the Financial Services team. Hi, Pinky. Hello, Shane. The Mauritius International Financial Centre has built its reputation on the domiciliation of foreign investments into jurisdictions located in Asia and Africa. With these foreign investments coming to Mauritius, foreign service providers have been encouraged to reach into our jurisdiction to offer financial products to service companies and funds established locally. Now, this means that these service providers have to be mindful of the financial regulatory regime in Mauritius and whether the products and services that they offer trigger any requirements to be licensed locally. It is from this angle that we're going to look at the regulatory regime in Mauritius for securities, lending and deposit taking and consider what requirements apply for providing these products from outside of Mauritius. So Pinky, we regularly advise on key issues for foreign service providers to provide securities locally. Now it's often the case that these securities are not registered in Mauritius. So does offering financial securities to investors in Mauritius trigger a licensing requirement here? The answer to this question is both yes and no, depending on the type of investors to whom the foreign securities are being offered. So it's important that we understand the investor regime in Mauritius. Mm -hmm. There are two types of investors recognized under the securities laws of Mauritius. One is sophisticated investor and the other one is retail investor. Sophisticated investors include under Mauritian law, for instance, a CIS manager, investment dealer, investment advisor, pension funds, insurers, the managers of the pension funds, uh, even high net worth individuals, government or government companies. Also, for the high net worth individuals, uh, we must know that the net worth threshold is 1 million USD uh, to be considered to be a sophisticated investor. And on the other hand, a retail investor is someone who is not sophisticated. Now, generally, if we try to understand the distinction between these two types of investors across the jurisdictions uh, throughout the world, sophisticated investors are considered and are expected to have better knowledge of the market and the kind of investments that they're going to make. And this is why they are treated a bit differently from the retail investors, because retail investors might not have the same level of knowledge that a sophisticated investor would have. This is why the regulators generally are more protective towards the retail investors rather than the sophisticated investors. For instance, even if we look at the laws in Mauritius, it's more stringent towards the retail investors. For instance, um, only a registered investment dealer or advisor can solicit a retail investor to enter into securities related transactions which means that um, any securities to be offered to a retail investor has to go via the locally licensed intermediary. And the same principles would apply even to foreign products. So to answer to your question, uh, if you have to offer foreign securities to retail investors in Mauritius, it has to go through a licensed intermediary. Okay, so to recap, an offer of foreign securities to local retail investors would trigger licensing requirements in Mauritius? Yes. Um, and we have to consider even the fact that even if the service provider is outside of Mauritius, the same uh, restrictions would apply. Uh, but there is an exemption to this. If a retail investor on its own approaches the service provider showing interest in a particular securities related products and saying that I am interested in that and I, I would like to know more about it and finally buys that product, then this does not trigger a licensing requirement for the service provider. Okay, but then is it the case that the, for, that the foreign service provider can use this exemption every regularly to avoid licensing? Not really. This should not be used on, on a regular basis because this is a regulated activity and then the local regulator may see the foreign service provider as conducting a regulated business in Mauritius asking them to be licensed. Okay, and this is the case for retail investors, mm -hmm. but what about sophisticated investors? Yes, so like I mentioned, sophisticated investors based on their knowledge level and their exposure to risk, uh, they are treated a bit differently and uh, even in Mauritius, they are exempted from the rule of solicitation that we just discussed. Um, 
this simplifies the the offer to sophisticated investors and it is permissible to make them an offer of foreign securities from outside of Mauritius so no licensing will be triggered if an offer is made to sophisticated investors okay and this was on the licensing side yeah. and I understand that offers can be made following the routes that you, you mm -hmm. just mentioned yeah so how should the offer be well, generally, an offer uh, to public of foreign securities would have required a prospectus registration requirement with the FSC, which is the local regulator. Um, however, there are certain exemptions that are provided under the law, and, and the relevant exemptions for our discussion is the one where the offer is done either to sophisticated investors only or via private placement. Private placement generally is a concept where the offer is being made privately rather than to the public. So there should not be an element of publicity in that. Um, the minimum subscription amount should be something which is prescribed by the FSC rules. Uh, however, there are no specific rules at the moment. Uh, and then the person has to subscribe from his own account rather than you know purchasing it for someone else. So this is private placement and sophisticated investors, like I mentioned, are, are classified people under the securities laws. Um, so any offer of foreign securities by a foreign service provider should be generally done by way of private placement or it has to be offered to sophisticated investors if they want to avoid a prospectus requirement. Okay. Is the offer of units or shares of funds treated differently? Not really, uh, they are treated almost the same way, but there is an additional route through which this offer can be made if it is a CIS or what we call a fund, uh, which, which is known as a permitted CIS activity route. Uh, under this route, an offer of units or shares of a collective investment scheme, which is based in a foreign jurisdiction and not registered in Mauritius, can be done uh, only to sophisticated investors through number one, a CIS manager, which is set up in Mauritius, or by a person who is licensed as an investment dealer in the foreign jurisdiction. So this is an additional route that can be followed if there is an offer of foreign CIS products. Okay. Thank you, Binky. So that concludes our section regarding the offering of financial uh, securities products into Mauritius from a cross border basis. Yes. Now we encounter similar issues when looking at banking products being offered on a cross border basis into Mauritius. Okay, so so do you when advise your clients come across a situation where you know we have a lot of funds in Mauritius and entities in Mauritius who look to invest in Asia and Africa through Mauritius uh, using it as a route and of course due to liquidity issues the foreign lenders sometimes may want to influx loans to these entities in Mauritius so uh, how what are the issues there and how, how does it work yeah so a foreign entity trying to to make a loan to a Mauritian company mm -hmm. could trigger licensing requirements okay but if that foreign entity is licensed in its home jurisdiction then it's going to fall under an exemption and there won't be any licensing requirement being triggered in Mauritius. Okay, but is there a risk if they are not licensed in their home jurisdiction? Yeah, there's actually quite a big risk mm -hmm. because first of all, the central bank can issue a cease and desist order requiring that the service provider stop the activities in question. Okay. Secondly, can also uh, request that the officers, senior di uh, directors and employees of the service provider be suspended. And there's always the risk of criminal liability because carrying out lending in Mauritius without a license is a criminal offence which is punishable by a fine of up to 1 million rupees or imprisonment for a term of up to 5 years. Oh, that's a huge imprisonment. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, this is a situation where um, a lender wishes to make an loan to entities in Mauritius or a person in Mauritius. We often come across a situation where you know lenders for their credit risk management um, issues, they, they want to sell their loans so that to sometimes to maintain their concentration limits or also to limit the sectoral uh, sectors where they are making the, the lending. So so how, how is that treated? Yeah, so the first scenario we're talking about before is the primary loan market, mm -hmm. where the, the lender makes a loan to, to the borrower. Now, the secondary loan market is where the, the existing lender sells the loan to, to yes. a third party and where where a foreign entity is looking to buy a loan made by someone to a Mauritian borrower that could trigger a licensing requirement here in Mauritius because that could be deemed to be money lending here. So, okay. But there is an exemption mm -hmm. so if that service provider is already licensed in its home jurisdiction to carry out that, that activity it won't need to, to be licensed in Mauritius. You mean money lending activity in its home jurisdiction? Yeah, exactly. Okay. How about other banking activities?
activities this was on the lending side mainly that we just discussed what about other banking activities can they be carried out on a cross border basis in Mauritius well banking activities generally cover quite a few different yes, activities yes, course, so yes. first of all it could be foreign exchange trading um, payment services or yeah. deposit taking um, foreign exchange trading and um, banking services is, is quite a wide category and can, offer, can, can include quite a few different products and generally what could, that can be understood as being foreign exchange trading, payment services and deposit taking. Yes. Now payment services and foreign exchange trading have a degree of local presence which is required to them which is why we're not, we're not going to cover this today. But if we look at deposit taking, um, this is a regulated activity in Mauritius. So if, uh, if an entity is looking to, to carry out the business of deposit taking in Mauritius, that's going to, to trigger a licensing requirement. So it is important that an assessment be made whether the foreign service provider is carrying on the business of deposit taking in Mauritius? Yeah, that's correct. And, and how is this determination be made? Well, the problem is that there's no established market practice or guidance on what could be considered as being car as carrying out business in Mauritius. The starting point though is the Companies Act, which provides a list of activities which will not be deemed yes. to, to result in the entity mm -hmm. carrying on business in Mauritius. There's a long list of activities that's out in the, the Companies Act, and one of them includes any isolated transaction. Okay. So the entry into an isolated transaction will not trigger, uh, will, will not cause the company to carry on business in Mauritius. So any determination of carrying on business will likely depend. First of all, on the proportion, and secondly, on the regularity of that service provider's business being conducted in Mauritius in comparison to its total global activities. But is there any proportion that has been, you know, provided by the regulator to to assess if if there is a carrying on business in Mauritius or not? Um, no, the regulator hasn't provided any any indication on that. But provided that the activity in Mauritius is not material to the global activities of the service provider and is not regulated. It is unlikely that the regulator will judge that this amount of to carrying on business in Mauritius. Okay, uh, now if I may connect it to a personal situation where um, you know I have an account with a foreign bank and I can use the app here in Mauritius on my phone, mm -hmm. and and sometimes I do transactions on that and use their services. Mm -hmm. So so how about those kind of transactions and and what we call digital banking in the digital world? Well, the Banking Act requires that anyone engaging in digital banking in Mauritius needs to be licensed by the central bank. So that's the starting point. So just to, to answer your question, there won't be any regulatory implications for your bank if it is not engaging in business in Mauritius. Um, now, to, to be able to determine whether it's engaging in, in digital banking business, business in Mauritius, we'll, we'll have to refer to the test that you guys will provide. So it's more about the proportion of the business that they are conducting in Mauritius. This is how they will be assessed. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so if I may recap, um, for lending, which includes both primary and secondary lending, the service provider has to be licensed in its home jurisdictions to be able to provide lending services in Mauritius, even if it is on a cross-border basis. Yeah. But in case of deposit taking and digital banking, the test is whether that entity is con conducting business in Mauritius, that is of deposit taking or whether they are doing actual digital banking in Mauritius. Exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Well, that was great information, Shane, and, and we got to understand how banking and lending businesses can be provided in, in Mauritius if, if a foreign entity wants to provide those services to, to entities and, and people in Mauritius. That was very insightful and I'm sure the audience would have benefited from that information as well. Thank you. Thank you, Pinky. And thank you everyone for watching.